Hello and welcome to the Go Green Home Show. This is an edition that's being sponsored by the Raleigh Library. And thanks to uh, Amy Roderick, she did a lot of the work in setting it up and getting the advertisement out. So the fact we have a very special guest today. And let me tell you a little bit about the Go Green Home Show. The whole purpose of the Go Green Home Show series is so we can learn about how to improve the quality of the air we breathe, both indoors and outdoors. And so there are many aspects to it. So we've been doing a series, and we're doing them in different libraries. And for anybody who wants to see them, they can go on in uh, the Raleigh station, and they'll have them listed there. And if you're interested, we'll give you a, uh, some information where you can get it later on. But for now, it's my pleasure to introduce Keegan Smith, who has the uh, great job of going around doing programs like this, and introducing what they do at Coca-Cola. Let me explain the whole thing to you because he's the expert. <laughs> so let's get going. Keegan, you're on, buddy. Awesome. Thanks for having me, Richard. Um, I just want to say first thank you to uh, the Rowley Library and uh, the local station coming out, and also for you guys to come out on this uh, starting to be gloomy Saturday uh, uh, morning, but as an intro, my name is Keegan Smith. Um, I'm the field sustainability coordinator for the Coca-Cola Bottling Company of Northern New England. So we're not the big Coke company in Atlanta. We're a local franchise or own company. Um, so what that means is we actually make all of our Coke products right here in New England. We have three production centers, um, one in Lundary, New Hampshire, which is where um, we originally started out with um, uh, kind of recently. And then we expanded not too long ago to include all of New England, um, upstate New York, and a little bit of Pennsylvania. So we got a lot of room to cover. But um, so I have a very awesome job. I get to go throughout all of that region and teach about recycling. Um, I graduated from UNH with a degree in environmental conservation and sustainability. So this is right where I wanted to be, and I love it. Um, but as a little bit more of a background, um, how this all started kind of was a fluke. <laughs> it all started by accident. And my boss started this, Ray Doobie, who's a sustainability manager at the company. Started about five years ago. Um, he was in charge of all the commodities, and commodities are just a fancy word for um, all of our recyclables. And at the time, we were recycling over 90% of everything that was coming through our London facility. Um, and he was at this recycling conference, and he was talking with a friend at the recycling conference about what our stuff was being made into. And what he was talking about was stuff like our cardboard. So you guys are probably familiar with our cardboard boxes, right? All, a bunch of our cases come in cardboard. Well, at the time, we were sending all of our cardboard to Parker Brothers down in Massachusetts to be recycled in the Monopoly board games. So have you played Monopoly before? Not yet. Not yet? Have you guys played Monopoly before? How recently? Oh. Has it been a while? Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, if you guys have played recently um, on a new cardboard uh, game of Monopoly, you're most likely playing on one of our old boxes here, which is pretty interesting. So a teacher overheard my boss, Ray Doobie, talking about this, and she poked him on the shoulder and introduced herself, and she was really smart because she asked for his card. And he kind of looked at her because at the time, nobody really asked for his card. You know, he just sat in an office and sold commodities, and that's all he did. So he gave her his card, and she goes, you got to come into my school. She's a teacher. And you have to teach my knuckleheaded kids why it's important to recycle. And he looked at her, laughed, and said, no. <laughs> That's not my thing. I don't teach. I, it's, it's out of my comfort zone. No. But she was smart because she had his card. So she emailed him, called him, badgered the crud out of him. And he eventually gave in. He said, sure, I'll come in. He grabbed some samples of what we recycled all of our stuff into. And he taught it. And... After, he's like, thank God, I don't have to do this ever again. He was terrified. He, he told me as a little side bit, he was in the Marine Corps for a couple of years. He was active duty in the Gulf, uh, in the Gulf War. And he said, I have never been so scared and frightened in my life teaching in front of those kids because he was so petrified of teaching. But anyways, she gave his contact information to everybody that she knew. And um, all these teachers kept asking him to come into their class and their class and their class. So he did a bunch of teaching those two weeks and it came down to the point where he had to sit down with their CEO, the president of the company, and he's like, well, what do you want me to do? This is two full-time jobs. And he goes, you know what, this, if you want to go around and teach, we can make that your full-time job. And now, five years later, we're teaching 120 plus days a year. Um, we're going to senior sitters. 
We're teaching uh, politicians about recycling. We go to state houses and testify because a long time ago, people used to look at Coca-Cola like we were the big polluters of the earth. And now state houses up here um, actually have us to come in and testify and talk about our experience in the recycling industry. We're industry experts now. So um, that's what I love about this job. Um, we do a really, really good job with, with um, sustainability. But our London Production Center, not too far away from here, well, um, we're what's called uh, zero waste. So we actually recycle over 96% of what comes into our facility. And the rest we do trash to energy. Um, so we're one of the few coke plants um, in North America that's zero waste. I'm really proud of that. Our two production centers in Hartford and Needham, um, we are looking to transition because we just, we just bought them. Looking to transition the, them into zero waste as well. So we're really proud about that. But um, some, some, some cool things about our facility, we switched to LED lighting. That reduced our energy consumption by 40%. Um, 40% less emissions in that end, so we're, we're proud about that. And what's cool is that an intern that I worked with when I interned with Coke um, until 2015 kind of spearheaded that. Um, so uh, we do little things like that. But the cool thing about the London Air Production Center is this. Right here. I don't know if the camera can see this, but this. Actually, I'm going to ask you guys this. What do you guys think this is? It's exactly what it is. That's a really good guess. So a lot of people will think this is a test tube or something, right? It looks like a test tube. And I tell everybody to look closely at the top. Yeah. Looks familiar, right? Looks like the top of a bottle where you screw your cap on. This is actually what our bottles look like before they come into a production center. You believe me? So what's cool about this is that we have something called a blow molding machine. And it's a giant, giant machine. We actually have two of them right now in our production center. And they take this. So this is a 20-ounce bottle right here. They take this into this machine into a mold. So it goes into the mold and then it's heated with infrared light. So it makes it uh, nice and hot and warm and uh, workable. And then <sighs> the machine blasts air into it and blows it up like a balloon into the blow mold. And then out comes a bottle. So they do 960 bottles a minute of this. And we filmed some videos. Um, if you guys are interested, you go into our YouTube channel, just type in Coca Cola Northern New England um, on YouTube. and They'll show you how this process is. And we had to slow down our machine, our machine, and the camera had to go into slow motion for it to capture how quick this is. So if we're doing two machines, we're doing about 2,000 bottles a minute when they're live, which is really cool. But how is this tying to sustainability? Well, when we're shipping bottles or preforms, what, what do you think you can fit more in a truck into the production center? Yeah. The preforms, right? So we actually decrease are shipping by 90% because it takes 10 trucks to ship empty bottles and one truck to ship the same amount of bottles with preforms. So that means 90% less emissions, 90% less driving, less wear and tear on the roads, less wear and tear on our trucks. And people often ask us, well, what about the drivers? Aren't you losing jobs? Well, no, because there's actually a crisis in America right now because we don't have enough drivers. So that's why on radio stations all the time you'll be hearing um, advertisements for drivers and all that because um, they're kind of drivers are really the backbone of society. Um, I don't know if you guys have heard this statistic before, but only five percent of all the food in New England is grown in New England. All that's trucked in. So if you really think about how important it is to have CDL drivers, commercial driver license drivers, it's it's really important. So, um, but to get to the recycling side of things, I'm going to kind of go down the line here. This actually started as a um, high school economics project, um, and he was working in collaboration with my boss, Ray Doobie, and what you'll see at the front here is the prices. So when you recycle, your scrap is actually worth money, right? So um, what's worth the most money is your aluminum. This is called the king of the curve, your aluminum. Um, it fluctuates between 60 and 70 percent, but your prices actually act like a stock market. Like you guys know how silver and gold the prices fluctuate, it's the same thing for all the stuff you throw in your recycling bin. This is how recyclers make money. So, um, I'm going to start with the, it's called 3 through 5 plastics. If you guys look at the bottom of a bottle, or any type of plastic, you'll see a recycling symbol. You guys are familiar with that? Um, I'm going to talk about the numbers here. So, the least common plastics are your 3 through 7s. What you see here, like your, your uh, yogurt containers, your butter tubs, your solo cups. But my favorite plastic to talk about in this range of plastics is your number sevens. 
Number seven is other, so it means pretty much anything that's other than PET, HTTP, whatever. I'm trying to keep it simple for you guys. Uh, but this plastic is actually made from cornstarch. It's not fossil fuel derived, which sounds good, right? Well, I did my capstone on this type of plastic because we were using it at UNH. And I was uh, eating at the, at the Union Hall down there. And I had my cup of Powerade. <laughs> and I was about to throw in the recycling bin because I thought it was plastic. I can throw in the recycling bin. Well, I looked at the recycling bin and there was a sign on top. And it said, you can't recycle the plastic cups that were made from cornstarch. And I thought, that's kind of weird. So I had to throw it out and I looked into it and that kind of became my capstone out of that. Um, but the reason is, is that it's made from, it's called polylactic acid, like I said, it's from cornstarch. And they say that it's compostable, right? So if you have a compost at home, do you think you recycle this? Mm -hmm. Absolutely not. You, this is industrial compostable, which means that you have to send it to an industrial facility that can get the temperatures high enough to get this to compost. Guess what we don't have in New England? A facility that is capable of doing that. At least around where UNH was. So, they couldn't recycle this because they didn't have the facility to do it. They couldn't compost it, so you had to throw it out. And I looked at what was called life cycle analyses to look at the environmental impacts of this uh, cornstarch cup compared to regular fossil fuel cups. And this actually, if you threw it in the garbage, had a worse environmental impact than most other plastics. Because the cornstarch was grown from corn, all that corn required a lot of fossil fuels, a lot of pesticides, a lot of nitrogen, all the fertilizers, right? And that has, if you overdo it, has some detrimental impacts to the environment. Then you throw it to a landfill, it sits there just like a regular plastic for, what, a couple hundred years to a thousand years? So, that's my favorite thing. They market this as a really sustainable product, but it really isn't, especially up here in the Northeast. So that's one of my favorite topics to talk about. But the second one is glass. So obviously Coke started with glass, right? Mm -hmm. that, the, the iconic contour Coke bottle. Well, we're not in glass very much anymore, but it's, it's less than half a percent of our business. We're not in it for a couple of reasons. One reason is, what's heavier? This or this? If you guys have ever held an old Coke bottle, before, it's really, really heavy. These are a lot lighter than what they used to be, but the thing about Coke balls is that they're heavy. So if we fill half of our Coke truck, or 52-foot tra uh, trailers, with just glass, we're overweight on the highway. <clears throat> which means if we went back to glass, we'd have to double our fleet, which means double the emissions and shipping, right? <clears throat> um, with plastic, we can fill that all the way up, all, all the trailers all the way up, and we're underweight on the highway. So that's why we went to plastic, because it's very cost-effective, and it's, um, it, it's actually really good on our shipping emissions, So, because we cut that in half. The <coughs> second issue is, when you throw this bottle in the recycling bin, what's going to happen to it? It's going to break, right? If it doesn't break in your recycling bin, I can guarantee you when they toss that into the recycling truck, it's going to break. If not in the recycling truck, it's going to break at the zero sort facility. So... When you have, like I was saying, aluminum, aluminum is, is, is worth a lot of money, right? And in, in the recycling world, if you have glass breaking and it gets into your aluminum can, because your can's open, right? Now you have glass inside all these cans and nobody at the facility is gonna look through each can and pick out the glass. It's just, there's no way. You're, you're talking with hundreds of thousands to millions of cans. And that glass will sit in that aluminum until they melt it down, and that glass is still stuck in that huge bale of aluminum, huge block of aluminum that's been melted down and ready to recycle again. If there's too much glass in that huge block of aluminum to be recycled back into a can, they have to throw the whole block of aluminum out. So that just makes everybody's efforts to try to recycle their cans go to nothing because we have too much glass contamination. So that's the second reason why, because glass isn't very recyclable, up, at least up in northern New England where we are. Um, Going down the line here. Tin and aluminum, like I was saying, are very simple to talk about with recycling. Aluminum cans, believe it or not, if there's not glass contamination, like I was saying, they're turning back into cans within 45 days and back on the shelf. So, um, plastic is a little bit different story. 
these are your number two plastics, so your, your milk jugs and your shampoo bottles, your, shampoo, um, your laundry soap jugs and all that. Of these two plastics here, which one do you think actually turns back into itself the most, the most often? No problem. The milk jug, right? So for a very, very long time, the dairy industry paid a premium to have this plastic back. They would pay recyclers a little extra to get this clear number two plastic back to be turned back into the milk jugs. So they like the color of it. It's nice and creamy looking like the milk and everything. So this has been dominated by that industry. But this is the same plastic, right? Number two plastic, if you look at the bottom. Why do you think that this isn't really recycled as often? Chemicals is the number one answer, but it's the number one wrong answer. Oh. Because, <laughs> because you dump this stuff down your drain every day, right? Yeah. What's the difference when you recycle it? It's um, what's that? Because it's thicker, it's a heavier no, It's not that thicker. Actually, HDPE number two plastics can be made into films just like this. Oh. It can't, it's just the, uh, the thickness of it. You can make it however you want. The answer is, for a long time, nobody wanted this recycled material. Because when you chop it all up, they don't color sort this stuff, it's too much effort. When they chop it up into all these different pieces, you know, my shampoo bottle at home is green. I've seen white shampoo bottles. I've seen Tide that's orange. I've seen Gain laundry detergent that's green. You have all these different colors in there. You melt this down, what color are you gonna get? The number one answer you get is yuck. It's a yucky color, right? You can get a rainbow, a gray, a brown, who knows? Tide's not going to want that back. They want the orange. Head and shoulder wants the white. You know, Clorox wants the white. They don't want a yucky color. Nobody wanted this. But my boss likes to say, we're Americans. Leave us alone. We'll figure it out, right? And that's exactly what this company did in New Jersey. This company in New Jersey is called Axion International, and this is what they came up with. Does anybody know what this is? Not insulation, no. It's actually very sturdy. It's very heavy. A door stop. No, it could be a door stop. What my boss likes to call this is big people's Legos. That's not the uh, official name for it. So what do you do with Legos? You build things, right? So Axon International out of New Jersey took this stuff that nobody wanted to see laundry soap jugs and shampoo bottles. They went out to York, Maine, not too far away from here. And they built a bridge out of it. Wow. Really? This bridge is made, the pilings, everything in it, except for the bolts and nuts, is made out of recycled laundry soap jugs and shampoo bottles. How do, do you know how they tested that prior to, especially with all the cold and incredible icing? How you tested it? Actually, it originally started out with as a, um, as a railroad tie for the Canadian Railroad Company. Wow. And... Um, their engineers are much smarter than me that figured this out. So that's a question for them, how they tested it. But they've definitely done some, some, um, some testing on it to make sure it was safe and everything before. And I've seen all the blueprints for different length bridges. But um, obviously it's strong enough to hold that, that um, steamroller right there, right? Steamroller, pretty heavy, isn't it? Well, that's pretty light compared to this M1A if you stay down for Bragg. That's on a laundry soap jug and shampoo bottle bridge right there, out of recycled material. But that's a feather compared to the trains that go over this one. And then this, this is in Virginia. So what I like to say is, this is York, Maine. It's a lot like Raleigh, Massachusetts, right? It's cold. It's near the coast. York is actually on the coast, so it, this is salt water down here. It's seen the hot in the summer. It's seen the snow in the winter. This bridge doesn't care. What's it going to look like in 100 years? It's the same. It's UV resistant as well. I don't know what chemical they put on it and everything, but um, it's UV resistant, so it's going to look the same in 100 years. And we love to go into state houses and talk about this because this is potentially the answer to our infrastructure problem that we're having in the United States. So, I wonder if it's expanding the traction. What's that? I wonder about the expanding into traction, especially your water. Yeah, I, I don't know, um, but it seems to be holding up okay. <laughs> it's right there. I don't, I don't, I don't think that uh, plastic really expands too much like that, you know. So. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure, but on to another one of my favorite subjects. I, I should just say this whole thing is my favorite subject because I keep saying it. But your number one plastic, right? This is what we use in most of our bottles. Number one plastic. If you look at the bottom, number one, the triangle. Well, this is the type of plastic that's used in pretty much all of your 
food goods, right? Number one, plastic is made to touch a bunch of your food, like your egg cartons, your um, ranch bottles, your Pyrojack containers, all that, because it's, um, it was designed to be antibacterial and hypoallergenic. So that means that it's not going to grow bacteria in your food and all that stuff. That's also a reason why yogurt doesn't use number one plastic, because the number one plastic, since it's antibacterial, will actually kill the cultures in yogurt, which is interesting. But um, my question for you guys is, of all the, the containers I hold in my hand, which one is the most important to recycle? That's a tough question. What do you say? I'll take that the odd one, just because it's odd. The odd one? The tomato container? Yeah, tomato. tomato container? Yeah. Well, I heard over here all of them, right? Yeah. That's a trick question. Yeah. It's all the same plastic, right? So it recycles the same. They're all as important to recycle. So when you recycle all this stuff, you're number one plastic. It gets sent to a facility. We send all of our number one plastic to a company called Ultra Pet in Albany, New York. And they use a similar process to most uh, number one PET processors in the nation. They do is they first color sort it. You usually have your, your clears and your greens, but they also have uh, brown plastics and all that stuff. So they put this in the color section, but get clears here. And it's all your labels, all your food gunk, all your gross stuff that can be in a bottle, all your caps and all that. It's all in here, right? So let me backtrack a little bit. In Raleigh, Massachusetts, you guys keep your caps on, right? I don't. You don't? So you guys have single stream recycling where you throw everything into one container, right? So if you have single stream recycling, always keep your cap on. Wow. Isn't it a different oh. plastic? It is a different plastic, but I'll get to that. Always keep your cap on. Because a long time ago, where recycling was being um, sorted and all that at your local recycling center, your transfer station, the huge problem was when you have plastic, you have to bale it. And baling just means that you're compacting everything down into a cube so it ships nicely. When you compact a bottle down that has a cap on it, and you put thousands of pounds of pressure, what's going to happen to that cap? It pops, off. pops off, right? And I used to do that all the time when I was younger, when I played baseball and stuff. I'm a twin. So I used to twist the bottle and like throw off the cap and hit my brother, and it was really mean. I'd get grounded. But that's what would happen in the transfer stations. The caps would go flying everywhere, so it was a health hazard because people could get hurt because it flies off at 60 some miles an hour. And they also had that problem with caps everywhere. So that's why they told everybody to just take the caps off. But now with the new technology, and I was just talking to Richard about how cool the zero sort technology is at Casella, um, all they do first is they just puncture the bottle and they compact it. But somebody, you just said that, what about the caps? It's a different plastic, right? How do you separate that? So when they color sort your, your containers with the caps on, and like I said, there's caps in here and everything when it's all chopped up, something's dirty, you gotta wash it to get it clean, right? Well, so they put this through a couple uh, baths to get it nice and clean, and they add some chemicals to it to wash it all out. And um, what they do is, since you have the cap, the cap is actually a number five plastic, which is the same plastic as your yogurt containers. What happens is, since the two different plastics, the caps have a lower density than the body of the bottle itself. So the caps actually float to the top of the bath, and the body of the bottle, the number one plastic, sinks to the bottom. That's how they separate it. So they just take a net and they siphon, they just skim it off the top. And then they send this back out into the market to be recycled. And then you're left with this, right? Before I get to this, your number five plastic right here. This is really cool to talk about because um, for a long time this was being recycled just in the caps and all that stuff. But there's a company that started out with a partnership with Stonyfield Yogurt in London, New Hampshire called Preserve. And what they did, was um, Stonyfield wanted to be able to recycle their cups. Because like I said, they couldn't use number one plastic because that would kill the yogurt cultures. And number five plastic, the yogurt container, was hard to recycle back then. This is back in you know, the 90s, 2000s. Um, it's, it's a lot easier to recycle now. But um, So they partnered with a company called Preserve. And Preserve took yogurt cups in the same process. They would chop it down, clean it, and then extrude it and uh, FDA approved. It's very clean. And they made them into toothbrushes. So this is all made out of your um, number five plastic store, caps, yogurt containers, and all that. And what's really cool about Preserve is 
Um, they've expanded now into cutlery. They're actually the exclusive cutlery provider of Whole Foods right now. And their cutlery, since it's a number five plastic, it's recyclable, right? Most cutlery is made out of the same plastic as styrofoam. It's called polystyrene. So um, you can't really recycle that. But you can't also recycle this in, in your bin because it'll get lost in the glass. It's too small. So what they do is they have their own containers at Whole Foods called Gimme Five containers. Yeah. And Whole Foods will backhaul that and then uh, they'll give it to Preserve and Preserve will just uh, give it to a recycler who will recycle this back into their products. So if you're at Whole Foods, throw this in the Gimme Five bin and it just, it's full circle. And they've expanded their line into you know, razors and all that. And when you're done with them, um, you can ship them back to Preserve. You can uh, go to Whole Foods, put them back in the bin. Or if you are a teacher, if you're a student, you can start a Gimme Five program where they will, uh, you can recycle all this stuff at your school as well, which is really cool. But here's the fun part. You're left with the number one plastic. Does anybody know what this could turn into? Up in the Northeast here? A lot of people think this just gets turned back into a bottle, right? Well, the closest facility that does follow the bottle recycling is in Texas. So that's the reason why we don't do bottle to bottle up in the Northeast. And for a while, the co company Atlanta was actually trying to get us to, to ship a lot of our plastic down to Texas so that we could boost our recycled content in our bottles. That just didn't make sense to us. Because from a sustainability standpoint, we were taking all of our material that we were taking back, and we were sending it to Albany, New York to get processed, and we were sending it to local companies to be recycled. But it wasn't in the bottles. What happens is, when you got this stuff, we sent it to a company called Foss Manufacturing in Hampton, New Hampshire. Or a long time ago, we were sending it to Polar Tech in Lawrence, Massachusetts. And what they were doing was, they were piping this off by the ton, to their ceiling, which is three stories high. And at their ceiling, they have a, a big furnace or oven. And plastic's really cool because when you melt it, it's a lot like melting chocolate. When you melt chocolate, it's really thick and gooey. Well, plastic acts the same way. And when it gets that consistency, they let it drip from the ceiling. Let it drip from the furnace three stories high. And why they do that is when it drips from the furnace, gravity is like somebody taking bubble gum and stretching it. Um, so when you stretch it, does it get thicker or thinner? Yeah. It gets thinner, right? So as it drops, it tapers. So as you can see here, it starts out really thick, kind of like plastic spaghetti. And then as it drops, it gets thinner and thinner. And then as it's hitting the factory floor, um, it's still kind of warm and workable. They actually roll it. And when they roll it, they actually get it to thinner than your own hair. And they crimp it. So have you ever pet a sheet before? Have you pet a sheep before? Doesn't that look like... Yeah, I'll give you that. Doesn't that look like you're petting a sheep right there? It looks like a sheep's wool. Pretty soft, right? That's actually all recycled plastic. So this is called polyester, right? You guys have heard of polyester. I'm wearing a polyester shirt right now. They take this, they spin it into a thread, like you see here, and they weave it. And that's how Polar, Polar Tech, back in 1981, created the first synthetic fleece. This is down in Lawrence, Massachusetts, right nearby here. And they also have a facility in Hudson, New Hampshire. And for a long time, they were using um, our number one plastic bottles to be made in their fabric. Now they've moved down to Virginia, and we supply all FOSS manufacturing with our, with our um, plastic. So FOSS manufacturing, if you've ever been to Home Depot recently, they have a fiber called EcoPie. And they do a lot of outdoor like carpeting, you know, for your patio or whatever. Um, but they've also done some pretty cool things. So I don't have the example with me today, but they've <coughs> done uppers of New Balance shoes before, where it's made out of completely 100% recycled um, plastic. Uh, you know, like the UNH Wildcat, you know, my alma mater. <laughs> they made like the hat for this. But what's really cool is they, they make surgical masks. So why do they make this out of plastic? Well, like I was saying, your number one plastic was made to be antibacterial and hypoallergenic, right? But when you re recycle that into a fabric, it retains those properties. So that's why you'll see surgeons wearing plastic masks, polyester masks, because it's hypoallergenic and <clears throat> antibacterial, which is really neat. That's also the reason why Vermont Teddy Bear uses plastic stuffing. 
Uh, Teddy Bear uses recycled plastic stuffing. Because originally, they used to use cotton, right? Cotton, nice little fuzzy ball comes from a plant. Well, cotton harbors germs. And that's the last thing you want around a newborn baby who might be slobbering all over it, right? Plastic, it's not going to harbor those germs. Germs hate plastic. They hate polyester. So that's why in Vermont teddy bear, we don't use cotton for teddy bears. And that's made right here in Vermont, of all places. <laughs> um, but what's really cool is when I go into schools and everything, I'll have the students raise their hands. I'll say, keep your hand raised if you have a fleece that looks like this. You know? Keep your hand raised if you have a North Face jacket, a Patagonia jacket, an L.A. Bean jacket, a jacket from, uh, you know, Bass Pro Shops, Cabela's, Nike, Under Armour, you know, all the, all the big players. By the end of the time I finish all these brand names, they all got their hands up. I said, chances are you're wearing recycled plastic. Which is a really cool thing. That, that's how we get kids to actually start to like recycling. They all know it's good for the earth. They know it's rainbows and butterflies, right? But they never, ever get to understand what it actually gets made into right here locally, which is really cool. And, you know, you get to start talking about the factories and all that. And um, that's what makes the job great. But let's get to a very controversial subject here. Grocery bags, plastic grocery bags. Good or bad for recycling? Right. See, it's a trick question. You, it's bad for the recycling bin. You never, ever, ever throw this in your recycling bin. I was just talking to Richard about this before the show. Um, at the zero sort facility for Casella or any other facility that, that does mechanical sorting, this will actually get caught in the gears. And when it gets caught in the gears, it can break the gears, it can cause fires and all that stuff. And actually at the lunch break, they have to stop the machine. Two or three guys have to go into the machine, which is pretty dangerous. They have to grab all the film out and then you know, throw it out. Um, but that's also a health issue for the workers because I'm not sure if a lot of you guys are aware about this, but we, we have a, I mean, we have a pretty bad opioid crisis going on, and a lot of people will stick their sharps into empty bottles and then put the cap back on. Well, when you shred the bottles, the sharps go loose, right? The shreds will get caught in the film in the gears, and when people and the workers go to grab the film out of the gears, they can get they can get pricked by it, which isn't good, right? So that's a huge issue with why you don't throw it in the recycling bin. Does anybody know where to recycle this? Grocery store. Grocery store, right? The grocery store, Walmart, Target, all of them will accept your plastic bags, right? But it's not only plastic bags aren't the only thing you recycle there in that bin. Do you guys know that? Yeah, bag. Right. You can recycle all of your bread bags, all your clean Ziploc bags, all your cereal bags, all your veggie bags, all your um, toilet paper casing wrapping and your water wrapping and all your um, um, paper towel wrapping, uh, your Amazon wrapping. Everybody's using Amazon these days, right? All your Amazon bubble wrap you can throw in there. Your dry cleaning bags, your English muffin bags. What else do I have in here? Your clean saran wrap you can throw in there. Anything that's a film and it's clean, you can throw in there. So you just, I just, I, I have a couple bags on my desk and I just go down to the local hampers and I just put it in there. But How do you know what plastic isn't recyclable from the stuff that you get from? So the films? Yeah, the things that you know that your food is in, it's either freezer bags and all so, things. So Trex decking is what gets made from this film. So have you guys heard, have you guys seen Trex decking? It's plastic composite decking. This is made from your shopping bags. They take this stuff, and they're the ones who are collecting it as well. So if you go on the Trex website, Trex decking yeah. website, they will tell you all the films that they accept. And I have a list right here if you're curious. You can come in, come up and, and see what they accept. But they will tell you what you can put in there and stuff. And I wish grocery stores did a better job of telling you what you can put in there. Because honestly, they, all they say is shopping bags. And it's much more than, than that that you can put in there. But we take a lot of heat for saying this because there's a lot of people out there who are trying to ban plastic bags, which sounds good. <laughs> sounds like a good thing to ban it because I hear crazy stories from people saying that they have plastic bags sucked, sucked up into their engines and killed their engines and stuff like that. This has happened on multiple occasions. I've, you know, you see it in trees everywhere. 
But the thing is, when you ban plastic bags, the grocery store doesn't have an obligation to recycle plastic bags anymore, right? That makes sense. Well, film is 5% of our waste. When you ban plastic bags, and the shopping, the grocery stores take away shopping bag recycling, that means that we can't recycle the rest of our film, our bread bags and all that. We're not gonna ban bread bags, right? <laughs> it's the only way you can come. Your cereal bags, the only way you can come. So now I don't have an outlet to recycle all of this stuff. But that's not to say that, that reusing bags isn't a good thing. Reusing bags is a great thing. So, um, but the thing is, the point I'm trying to get is when you ban plastic bags, you're also taking away recycling all the other films. So, but I do advocate for using, reusing bags and all that stuff as well. But that's just another side of the story that people need to consider. Um, trying to think of other things that I got here that I haven't gone over yet. So our pallets. About 20 years ago, we switched from oak pallets to plastic pallets. We still use some oak pallets to places where no one are not going to get our pallets back. But these pallets are cool because they last forever. We've had these pallets for 20 years and we haven't really had to recycle any of them. They don't get damaged very often. Oak pallets have an average lifespan of three uses. And then they have to get recycled and all that. And who knows what they recycle it into. It's like it burned. So this switching the pallets into our cases and all that stuff in plastic, we've saved over 300,000 oak trees within uh, a, de a decade or two, which is pretty amazing. Um, if you think about 300,000 oak trees, imagine how much land that would cover. You know, oak trees can take 50 years to grow, to grow to maturity and all that. So um, that's, that's one of our, our proud conservation moments as well. Um, clothing, can you recycle clothing? Where do you guys recycle clothing at? Bins. Right, so you can go to Planet Aid bins, the, the big recycling, uh, they're not recycling bins, they're um, donation bins that are usually, you can see them at schools or at fire departments, usually host them as well. Uh, my favorite though is Goodwill. Goodwill or Salvation Army, the, those, they all do the same thing, but they don't want your clothes that, they don't only want your clothes that can be sold in their stores, right? They want your, your torn and tattered clothes, they want your one glove that you can't find the other glove to, they want all of that stuff. Because at the end of the day, what they do is they sort out what's good, what's bad, and all that. If it looks good, they're going to put it in their stores and see if somebody wants to buy it locally first. Right? If that doesn't sell within a couple months to a year, what they're going to do is they're going to build that up. They're going to send it overseas, and they'll give it away to people who are less fortunate than us um, and in countries that are developing. If they don't want it, if it's too torn, if it's too tattered, if, they have, if we have extra gloves that don't have another pair or two that we can't resell, what they do is they just shred that up and it starts back as fuzzy pieces of cotton or polyester. And then they make it back into clothing again, which is really cool. Yeah. May I insert something? Sure. Um, the Council on Aging is going to have a fundraising drive in April where we will have a container for leather goods, uh, shoes, sandals, sneakers, belts, purses, anything like that. And it's going to be uh, taken by EcoSmith. Okay. from New Boston, New Hampshire. Awesome. And they will send what is usable to underdeveloped countries and then recycle the rest. Right. So that would do all these things that you're talking about, right? Right, right, exactly. That's exactly what we're talking and about. So we're going to be doing a good thing. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> that's exactly what I'm talking about. That's a whole process. It's a, it's a local example of how it works. So that's awesome. If you guys need any help from, from our standpoint, let us know. Oh, okay. Yeah, so we can help you out with that. But that's exactly how it works. They want your torn entire clothes. Only thing that you can't recycle are clothes that have been stained with oil. Because that actually ruins the, uh, the fabric. So I'm talking about like car oil and stuff like that. It, it ruins the fabric and it's no good anymore. But other than that, you can pretty much recycle anything. Even if it's stained with food or whatever, they, they'll take it. Um, I don't know if you guys have moved recently, but um, <clears throat> they use a lot of recycled clothing to make moving blankets. Um, they wrap, you know, all your wood furniture, moving blankets and stuff so it doesn't get dented and all that. If you look, they have a bunch of different colors in them. That's because it's, it's a pretty simple way to recycle clothing. But that, that's one of the simpler ways to recycle it. You can actually recycle it into wearable clothes, which is cool. Um, just to kind of wrap up a little bit here, how about... So my boss is actually, he was at school one day, and there was a smart aleck kid 
sitting in the back, and he raises his hand after his presentation was done. He goes, oh, yeah? Can you recycle hair? <laughs> and my boss looked at him and smirked, and he's like, yeah, actually. And all the kids were like, looking at each other, and like, are you, are you serious? You can recycle hair? And he goes, have you ever heard of locks for love? Or pants seem to go for lengths? I, I came from London High School in New Hampshire. Um, we did something, we did Pants in Beautiful Lengths, and we do some of the biggest um, donations in the entire country. So one year we had Good, Good Morning America come to our school. That's how big it was. And they did their morning segment there. And over 100 people donated over, I think, four or five inches of hair. Um, and what, that, what they do with that, that hair is they obviously clean it and they make it into wigs for people who are battling cancer, um, burn victims, or people who need it. So, um, yes, you can recycle hair. But um, my presentation is pretty much finished, and I'll, I'll turn it over to Richard or to anybody who has questions. Well, sure. No, I think you did a great job. And, uh, feel free if you get questions. Because well, you... I'd like to ask you about the caps, because um, at our recycle, mm -hmm. you have to flatten <coughs> everything. Really? Okay. And everything that you possibly can. To save on space and hauling and, and all that. Flatten the thing. Uh -huh. So you can't really put the cap down. Okay. To take it off and stomp it, and then you can't. Okay. Uh, what, what town are you in? Um, Raleigh. Raleigh? Yeah. You guys don't have recycling bins? No. no. You don't in the town of Raleigh? Interesting. So talk to your transfer. You don't see it on your way home. Oh, yeah? Just near the small yeah, place. I should. I should. I should ask him before I give you guys advice on how to recycle wrong. <laughs> but, yeah, talk to your transfer uh, station manager, because I was talking about if you have... If you have a recycling bin that's single stream, leave your caps on. But if you have a, uh, if you have to bring recycling to a recycling center, your best um, source of information is going to come from your recycling center manager or whoever's working there. If they don't accept caps, which is really common with transfer stations or recycling centers, um, you can start what's called a Give Me Five program, like I was talking about, and you can throw your caps in there. Um, <clears throat> but ask, ask, what's that? So they're not transporting air? Yeah, exactly. Exactly, yeah. So they they told you to put the caps back on? No, but you just throw the cap in. Oh, that's what I do. So the cap into the pile? Yes. No, uh, because that'll get lost. Yeah. Yeah. And can't the, um, once the liquid is poured out of the bottle, you can scratch the bottle yourself, and then not the, the rim where the cap was on, you just heal, and you put the cap on lightly. I've done that. Yeah. The That's bottle. true, yeah. Yeah, make sure all the liquid's out, smash the bottle, and then put up the cap on. You could try that as well. Yeah. But talk talk to your, your manager first about that. You really should stop in on that. Yeah. And then we'll see why I will not be talking. No, no, I believe you. I've been to plenty of transfer stations, so, yeah. Um, yeah, that's why it's tough to teach recycling, because every town is different. Mm -hmm. So, when in doubt... Look up on your website. I, I briefly looked at Reality's website, but I, I just figured you guys had been. Um, if you can't find the information on the town website, talk to your recycling center manager. That's your best source of information. Yeah? What are the biggest mistakes people make on things that shouldn't be recycled? Ooh, that's a very good question. Biggest mistakes. Well, what's funny to me was when I was at college, I think college kids were the absolute worst recyclers. Ever. <laughs> um, if it weren't for me, I'm not sure my roommates would have even recycled. But um, the biggest mistakes is people not recycling. That's the biggest mistake you, you can make right there because, like I was saying, aluminum, this self sustains a lot of towns in the recycling programs. This is what pays for recycling programs up, up here. But a lot of people, if you just sit by a recycling bin and watch, it's, it just boggles your mind. Um, people will throw in food. It's people that don't care. Those are the biggest mistakes. Right, right. Um, I don't have my peanut butter jar with me today. But a lot of people think that you have to completely clean out your peanut butter jar, get the sponge in and everything, and that just turns so many people off from recycling, right? You don't. You know, I don't. Oh, I've seen signs say clean the water. What I do, that, that's funny you said that, peanut butter. Mm -hmm. I put hot water, soap, hot water. You let soap? It's like, I'm not going to Don't, it. But don't waste, the, water's a precious resource, right? Well, then I'll pour the water from one bottle into the next one. Right, so you're using it's the water. Right. Water. right. So my boss likes to say, don't, wait, don't waste water, it's a precious resource. Right. And also keep recycling simple. 
don't turn people off from it because it's a good thing. So he says, if you want to really watch out your ball, I'll give it to your cat or no, I can have them go at it. <laughs> have a great time. Watch them lick their mouth for about an hour, and then it's, it's hilarious, right? But we're using water already to recycle this. What's harder to get off? The label that's glued on there tight or the food? The label's way harder to get off. So by the time that label's off the bottle, the food's long gone. Obviously, you want to limit the amount of food that's in your containers, um, especially if it's liquid, get it all out. If it's food, make sure there's no food in it. But if it's peanut butter and you have a little bit left on the, on the edges of it, it's not a big deal. Um, so that, that, that's one of the biggest mistakes, especially in regions like California where water can be really you know, unpredictable. Why waste the precious resource, right? Um, Should you be taking the labels off of your can? No, don't don't bother. Really? No, keep it on. Because like I said, when when they chop this all up, you get all your labels and stuff in there, right? The labels float with the caps, so you just skim it off. Um, the other big mistake that we kind of went over already was that people don't recycle this because they think that yeah. hey, there's chemicals in it, I can't recycle it. That's that's baloney. <laughs> You can recycle this because we pour Clorox down the drain all the time. They're capable of, uh, of stripping that out. So, you know, you, I don't know if they got that, especially for the COAs and stuff like that, the Council on Agents. You're actually, your operational problem, you'll do a program for them. Right. I do, see, I do senior centers a lot. Um, I was talking with Richard before this because I love going, I'll, I'll do elementary schools and I'll teach first and fifth graders, and the next day I'll go to senior centers. So it's like, <laughs> I, I do all age groups, and, and it's, it's, I have a great time with it, but I do um, uh, senior sitters, I go to schools, I go to any type of event that you can think of, um, I'm there. So if you guys ever want me to come in and, and talk, I, I'd be more than happy to. Have you, on um, your college campus, do you have, you must have recycling bins out everywhere. Yeah, they're, they're everywhere. Yeah. But if you ever look, if you go to a, to a college campus and you look in those recycling bins, um, I can guarantee you're going to find a ton of contamination. And if you, if you guys have ever been to like a, like a ballpark or even one of our accounts, like restaurants, they have the uh, Coke Contour um, recycling bins. They're in the shape of a bottle. Have you seen those? I'm not sure if you're familiar with them. No. But they're, we try to make our recycling bins look cool and fun to recycle. And what we do is um, they're meant to recycle cans and bottles. We have a circle cut out on the, on the recycling bin. Wow. And in the circle, we put um, like rubber um, kind of like strips in them. And the reason why we do that is when you put your bottle in, it's supposed to go in nice and easy. But if you try to put a napkin in or something, then you have to put your whole hand in there. And when you pull it out, like the rubber comes with you. And it's like, if there's gunk on the rubber, it's going to get in your hand. It deters people from doing that. So if you go to a college campus or anything similar, a public event, you look in that recycling bin and you look at all the food, all the napkins that shouldn't be in there, and all the contamination, it's disgusting. And like I was saying... Like I was saying, when I was at UNH, when they had the cornstarch cups, all, people just figured, hey, it's plastic, I can recycle it, right? And threw it in there, and the sign clearly said, don't throw this in there. Mm -hmm. So, you get all that contamination. If this gets into the same plastic as your number one plastic, it's the same issue with glass and aluminum. If this gets bailed in with the number one plastic and melted down, and this is melted down with the number one, it has, they have to throw the whole thing out. So... Okay. Thank you. Can you talk to take out containers at all? Okay. Take out containers. Yeah. We can talk about that. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for having me. Okay. And we'll you're talk. Be around for a few minutes if you have questions. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'll be around. Okay. Okay, folks. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you very much.